We have a really messed up perception of what happiness looks like and what marriage looks like and what love looks like. Now, I get in, in the demographic we've got in this room, I, I'm going to imagine that not a lot of you watched those movies and then went home and felt like you needed to apply that level of love and that level of affection to your marriage. I'm going to guess that wasn't the bar. I got it. So, so maybe the Hollywood metaphor doesn't work for you. Let me ask you another question. Um, does, does Facebook have an impact on you? Do you compare your marriage, do you compare your life to what you see on Facebook? My assumption is if you're shaking your head, no, it's because you don't have it. God bless you. <laughs> if the answer is yes, it's because you do have it and you look at it. The, the message we get is all wrong and it's problematic. For the record, I have a lot of problems with the movies that you just saw, Titanic in particular. Number one, uh, the, the relationship was doomed. It's a good thing Jack died. That was not going to work. There are a lot of problems from a marriage and family therapist perspective. I watched that movie and thought, nope, nope. Kids, this has no chance. And two, at the end, it's about spoiler alert if you haven't seen this, by the way, he dies. Uh, at the end, when they're on the, he's on the door, she's on the door, and he's in the water, we can't, like, go halvesies? That's been a problem with, I've had that issue every time I've seen that movie. Instead of Jack dying, maybe we both agree to lose an arm to frostbite. I take one side, you take the other. That, my friends, is marriage. I get, I get that you may not be as susceptible to the, to, to the Hollywood imagery uh, that we just looked at, but I want to go back to Facebook for just a second. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the impact that Facebook has on us, the impact that it has on our marriages, and I get there's probably a couple of you in this room who that just made really nervous and uncomfortable because you know your spouse kind of has an issue with it. Uh, easy, not tonight. Calm down. We're gonna, it's going to be a while before we get to that. Uh, but I want you to know that, that what we see and what we, what we experience, what we read, it affects the way we think. I, I wish I could put this quote every time you open up Facebook. It's one of my favorite quotes in the world. It really and truly is uh, uh, the thief of joy. Comparison is the thief of joy. When you are scrolling through the, the websites that you're scrolling through, when you scroll through Facebook, you're not just seeing other people's highlights. You internally, whether you know it or not, you're comparing their highlights to your reality. And the problem is, in doing so, you're setting yourselves and you're setting your spouse up for failure. And how do we do that? Uh, the reality of your life will never compare to the fiction that other people post online. The reality of what it would be like to be with your high school boyfriend will not match the, fictition, or the fictitious view that you have of it because you only see the highlights of his life. His life is just as problematic and messed up as yours. It just doesn't look that way because you only see it on Facebook. Make sense? We get a lot of really bad messaging, and here's the truth. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to love, when it comes to what intimacy really looks like in a marriage and what it's supposed to look like in a marriage, here's the most exciting thing I can say. It's really boring. It is. The truth of how to build intimacy and how to be close is kind of boring. It makes a terrible bumper sticker because the truth is the happiest marriages are based on a really sound, solid friendship. That is not something that we shout from the mountaintops, and it is not something that we, that we make t-shirts out of, but it is absolutely the case. The happiest marriages are the ones that are based on mutual respect uh, for each other and enjoyment of each other's company. We've stigmatized this. I cannot tell you how many times I have been in my office and had a couple walk into me and say something to this effect. Well, we're really good friends, but we just, the passion's gone. Yeah, you've been married 20 years. To me, when I hear that, let me tell you what I hear. What I hear is, you've got like 80% of what you need. You've got a great foundation. You just need some help with the stuff that makes the marriage really exciting. Now, just for the record, I am not advocating a passionless marriage. Okay, at no point will you hear me say that the way to a happy marriage is to, is to lower the bar. In fact, research indicates the opposite. People who have the highest expectations of their marriage have a tendency to have the happiest marriages. So I'm not advocating a passionless marriage. What I'm advocating is for you to reimagine what your marriage is supposed to look like. Your marriage is supposed to look like a friendship with a little bit of passion and a little bit of excitement and a little bit of craving. It is not supposed to look like what we just watched. It's not supposed to look like passion, 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 and then maybe we get along at the end of the day. It's supposed to look like friendship. So that's where the reimagined part comes in. And here's the, uh, here's the good news for you. Getting back to yours is not that tough. And it's going to be the theme that we're going to focus on over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, tonight, we are going to begin establishing an environment within your marriage that allows you to do what Paul describes in Ephesians 5. We're going to look at that here in a minute. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to that, Ephesians 5. We're going to look at, at, at the, the type of marriage that Paul wants us to have. 
Um, it, it's an environment where you can uh, accept mutual submission within the marriage. I want to mention a guy really quickly, and there's a reason I want to mention this. this guy, his, his name is John Gottman. If you are in the counseling world at all, you know who this guy is. The reason I mention him is because, especially tonight and next week, we're going to do a number of activities in here that are, that are his or based on his work. Um, ordinarily, uh, we'll just cite stuff at the end and be done with it, but especially this week and next week, I relied really heavily on his content, and I don't want you to come across one of his books think that uh, I stole it and didn't give him credit for it. I'm going to steal it, sure, but I'm going to give him credit for it. Um, any of his books, if you get a chance to read them, they are all fantastic. Uh, and he is a guy, he's the marriage and family therapist to marriage and family therapists. All right, moving on. Tonight, the theme is rediscovering your spouse. That little piece of paper that you've got in front of you, uh, that is all about rediscovering your spouse. Uh, we're going to talk about who they are, who they were, who they're going to be, their past, their present, their future. But I want to ask you to do two things. Before we get into the content tonight, before we get into the, uh, the meat of what we're doing, the first thing I want to ask you is this. As best you can, please leave everything at the door that you came in with. I, we've got kids. You've got kids. We've all got bills. We've all got jobs. We've all got things that get in the way. I want to ask you as best you can to take a deep breath. And I want to ask you to leave those outside. Leave everything outside. And I know I got the O'Quins and they got like 17 kids. I'm asking them to do the same thing. <laughs> Leave it, all, leave it all outside. Tonight, I want you for the next, I got about 35 minutes left. For the next 35 minutes, I want you to be zeroed in on, on what God wants for your marriage and what your spouse needs to hear from you. The second thing that I want to ask you to do is to be open to the fact that God has a reason for you to be here. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I don't know why you're here. I hope it's because you saw something that advertised a, an opportunity to reconnect with your spouse and you jumped at it. But I'm not crazy. Some of you are here because your wife saw a Facebook video and she dragged you here. I got it. It's all right. I love you anyway. Here's what I'm asking you for. I'm asking you that tonight you do me a favor and, and be open to the possibility that God wants you here for more than a reason than just your wife saw a Facebook video. I, I'm hoping that you'll be open to the possibility that God wants you here because there's a plan for your marriage and uh, that plan may begin with some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, if you would, if you have Ephesians 5 open, we're going to start in verse 21, which I think is probably a pretty obvious place to start. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do the Lord. End of seminar. Everyone go home. <laughs> Keep reading with me. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, beginning in verse 21 of this passage, Paul assumes the role of spiritual philosopher. He creates a household code for people to live by. Um, if you were in my chapel class on Sunday, you heard me say this, and I'm going to say it again now. Uh, verse 21 is revolutionary. It is not a simple concept, and it's not something that uh, sounded the same to the audience that heard it then that it sounds to us now. Uh, submitting to each other out of mutual submission was a groundbreaking thing. And the reason it was so groundbreaking is because what one word would you use to describe the family structure in these days? Patriarchy. Patriarchy. But even that's underselling it a bit. In a patriarchy, the, the husband is the head. In this type of patriarchy that he was writing to, the husband was the head, and that was kind of the end of the story. There was no opinion coming from anywhere else. So the idea that marriage would be based on mutual submission was nothing less than revolutionary and groundbreaking. Now, you'll notice in the rest of that passage we just read, you'll notice that Paul sticks with the patriarchal structure. I'm good with that. Um, and obviously that's, that's, that's a given. It's in Scripture. That's a biblical interpretation. Uh, the idea that a patriarchal structure is biblical is something I don't want to miss. In my profession, marriage and family therapy, uh, using the words patriarchy and submission, they're tough to get into because people in my field don't like to hear that. The reality is that structure works. It is a biblical structure, and it works really, really well. Now, here's, here's where we're going to focus tonight. In verse 21, Paul talks about mutual submission. The goal tonight is to do everything that we can to try and make that a reality. Here's what I mean. Uh, in order to, to create mutual submission between you and your spouse, you have to create an environment where that's a desirable thing, where that's, a, that's something that can be done safely, that's something that can be done um, uh, out, of, out of love and care and respect and because it's something you want to offer. The Greek word for submit in that passage uh, can be used as, as voluntary submission as opposed to uh, involuntary obligation. 
Okay, and I say that because that's what we're going to try to do. If that's your reality, what we need to do is create an environment where uh, that's, that's easy to do, where submission is easy. Now, the question I have for you is, how do couples make it through hard times? We're going to transition now into the stuff, the meat of what we're doing, and the stuff that I'm going to have you do activity-wise. There's a misperception that couples that make it through hard times, they're either really good at fighting, like they're, they're experts at, at negotiating an argument, and that maybe there's a degree of truth of that at times, or they, they, there's a perception that they just got lucky and married the right person right out of the gate. I think both of those are factually inaccurate. I think no matter where you are in your relationship, uh, you can be the kind of couple that, that makes it through hard times well. Here's why. Couples make it through hard times by doing one thing, and it sounds really weird, but it's one thing. They make it through hard times by talking a lot when things aren't hard. They make it through hard times by getting to know each other really, 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 really well, by understanding how the other person ticks, by understanding their background, by understanding who they are, their dreams, their hopes, their desires, their fears, their insecurities. That's how you create the type of marriage that makes it through hard times. Uh, John Gottman, who I referenced a minute ago, he calls this idea creating a love map. And what a love map is, a love map is how you get out of trouble once you get into trouble. Now, you remember me saying on the Facebook video that this, web shop, or this, this workshop is designed to get you to a place where you'll avoid the trouble altogether. Uh, this is how. I'm hoping you're in a good place in your marriage. If you're not, that's all right. We'll, we'll work through it anyway. I'm hoping you're in a good place right now. Because the stuff we're going to do tonight is supposed to take the good place that you're in and, and allow you to create a wall together around your marriage so that these bad things don't creep into it. Um, happy marriage is rooted in friendship. You heard me say that a minute ago. Uh, intimate knowledge is vital to real friendship. If you think about the spectrum of your friendships, so you've got the people on this side who are the casual acquaintances, and you've got the people all the way on this side who are the deep, uh, meaningful relationships that, that you call on most. What's usually the difference in those two? Knowledge. It's how much they know about you. It's how much you know about them. It's how much time you've spent together, the intimate conversations you've had. Um, I, I've met a lot of great people over the last few years. By, by nature, I don't think any of them are ever going to reach the level of friendship of the guys that I've known since I was 18 that I went to ACU with. They, I've known them for 20 years. We have a degree of intimacy between us that just doesn't exist in new relationships. The same thing is true for your marriages. It's, it's vital to your success as a married couple that you know and understand each other. So right out of the gate, how well do you know your friend? And we're going to play a little game to find out. Here's what I want you to do. There is, on page two of that little handout, it says love map game. Here's the goal. They're in the back. Jordan Hawk, they're in the back. I won't call you out, though, for being late. <laughs> Jordan Hawk. Somebody hand Jordan Hawk a handout. Um, all right. Here's how this is going to work. Oh, Blake O'Quinn. Man, we are just, we're batting a thousand with ministers. Uh, so here's how this is going to work. I'm going to give you, I'm going to put five minutes on the clock. In those five minutes, here's what I want you to do. You are going to be quizzing your partner to see which one of you knows more about the other. You will notice on page two where it says Gottman Love Map Game. There's a whole bunch of questions. You'll notice a number in those questions. That's the point value. Okay? So, for example, uh, Tim, what's number 13? Uh, what's my favorite meal? Your favorite meal is uh, anything. <laughs> I'm going to give my answer for Tim. I'm going to see if, he, if, if I get it right. Tim then determines how many points I get. Make sense? So it is up to your spouse to determine how many points you get for that question. If it's a two-point question, you only get half of it right. You only get one point, no arguing. All right, everybody clear on the rules? This is pretty simple. I want you to turn to your spouse, and I want you to engage in mutual warfare. All right, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about this handsome, strapping young man you see on the screen in front of you. That's right. I want to tell you a story about that lady killer right there. I went through a bit of an awkward stage. It was called childhood. When, I'm not done yet. I'm coming out of that at some point. Uh, let's talk about that little guy. So when I was a kid, and I mentioned on the, on the post yesterday that I was going to tell you a story, and, and here's, here's that embarrassing story. Uh, when I was young... I'm not going to say how old because of what I'm about to say. I was in a baseball game. Uh, I, was, I was not a bad baseball player. I wasn't a great baseball player. I was good enough to play the infield. 
uh, but not good enough to have any plans to play beyond Little League. So I, I was in a game, and I was playing shortstop, and a ball got hit to me, and I missed it, which happened from time to time. And the game uh, kind of continued, and the pitcher did the thing where he did kind of the, uh, and the second baseman did the, oh, Ryan. I got a couple of those, and then, as it tends to do, the game continued, as did the swelling of my emotions. And about two pitches past that moment, I started to cry. A lot. <laughs> Enough to where they had to stop the game because the shortstop was crying. <laughs> now, if your question is, well, how old were you? I don't know, but too old for that. Too old for I, 10, 17, I don't know. I was, <laughs> I was too old. Now, I remember when they stopped the game, I remember the, the umpire walked over to me, which is not something you want to be in this situation, and he looked at me and he goes, hey, buddy, which is, again, not a good thing to hear at a baseball game. Hey, buddy, what's the matter? Everyone's mad at me. That's what I said. <laughs> Ankle, why didn't I say it was hurt? No, it was, uh, everybody's mad at me. So rather than, rather than actually claim an injury, I claimed an emotional injury. So I am the only person I know of who had to stop a Little League baseball game for an emotional foul. <laughs> I tell you that story because that is one of the most embarrassing moments of my childhood, and now it serves a purpose in my marriage. And the, marriage, uh, the purpose that it serves in my marriage is, it is it's weirdly become kind of an inside joke with April and I. Weird, she liked that story for some reason, and she reminds me of it all the time. Specifically when our five-year-old is running down the soccer field in the middle of the game going, group hug, everybody! <laughs> Which happens a lot. And in those moments, my wife looks at me and goes, he's going to cry in baseball too, you know that, right? <laughs> All right? I say that because that story has become a bonding moment between my wife and I. That story came from doing the kind of stuff we're doing tonight. We were just talking. We were talking about our past. We were talking about things we remembered about each other, and it sounds bizarre to say that that was the deliberate purpose of the conversation. That was the purpose of the conversation. It was to talk about our past and to talk about things about our, our lives that we didn't know yet. If you had told me at, and I'm going to say I was eight when that baseball thing happened. Again, I was probably like 16, but whatever. Uh, if you had told me that it, it, something that happened when I was eight or nine or 10 in a baseball game would have been a bonding experience with my wife, I would have thought you were crazy, but it is. And it is because the stuff that we're talking about tonight is stuff that can come up regularly. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move past, soak it all in for just a minute, because I'm going to move off uh, Lady Killer Ryan. The foundation of a happy marriage is friendship. I, I, this is something we just talked about. Uh, real friendship requires an intimate knowledge of each other. Increasing the intimate knowledge that you have with your partner requires effective communication. I think we make a mistake in marriages. We have deep, intimate conversation pretty regularly, actually. We, have, we go beyond surface level with our partners a lot, but usually when we do that, what are we talking about? The kids, we've just gotten in a fight, we've been arguing. We tend to only go deep into real meaningful conversation with our spouse in moments where uh, something bad has happened and we feel like we're trying to put the pieces back together. Uh, what I want to encourage you tonight is to have these conversations in a moment when things are really good. And that's what tonight's about. It's about facilitating that, facilitating that kind of conversation. Uh, I want you to know each other, but I want to go places that you haven't been before. Now, before we move on to the second activity, uh, there are two things that have to happen in an effective conversation. Um, I know that, that uh, I, I've got a lot of therapy background, but this is not, not rocket science. The first one's listening. Want to take a guess what the other one is? We'll get to that in a minute. The first one's listening. Uh, we live in a world where nobody listens, and specifically actively listens. When's the last time you remember having a conversation with your spouse or one of you didn't have a cell phone in your hand or at least fairly close? We don't listen to each other anymore. The TV is on. I notice from time to time, it feels bizarre to me to turn the TV off at like six o'clock in the evening. I'll put it on pause and then the little DirecTV logo comes up and hypnotizes everybody in the room. But turning it off feels bizarre. Have you ever noticed like it's weird to turn the TV off because that means that the day is over. Because if the day is not over, then the TV should be on, right? There's always distractions. We multitask. Simply put, we don't listen. Uh, men, this one's for you. Uh, and it, or if it's not for you, that's great. You're doing better than most. And I don't mean to gender stereotype, but you know, I'm gonna. Uh, there's a reason I chose a picture of two women having a conversation. Ken made this point in the, uh, in the chapel class last quarter, that if you ever watch two women have a, a conversation, they have a tendency to, to body language wise, they have a tendency to turn towards each other. They have a tendency to kind of lean in. They have a tendency to grab on to the emotion. 
Uh, we as men, we do the opposite. We kind of just sit back and make ourselves real big, and we're in, we're out. And if you're not talking about sports, I don't want to hear from you. Uh, if you're going to listen to your partner, you need to do a couple of things. Number one, fight to the distractions. I want to challenge you to do something tonight. When you go home, commit to your wife to not have a conversation with your phone in your hand, period. Not, not just tonight, not just for fun, but period. Uh, April and I have a, 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 an agreement um, that she gave me. Uh, <laughs> and the, the agreement was... The agreement was we needed a way to solve the problem of us talking and someone picking up a phone without it always having to be an argument or always having to be a conversation. So the agreement was if you pick up a phone while I'm talking to you, I'm just going to stop talking until you put the phone down. And when the phone's down, we're going to pick back up like nothing ever happened, but it's going to be our kind of nonverbal cue that, you know, put the phone down or I'll shoot you. Uh, so number one, uh, get, get rid of your distractions. Number two, make eye contact with the person you're talking to. Um, you would be shocked. And I want you to do this here in a minute. It's going to feel weird. The first minute of like really locking in, it's going to feel like, like Predator. Like you're going to do something with that. <laughs> it's going to feel weird. Why does it feel weird? You don't realize how little you look at your wife. She's right there. Look at her right now. See, it's weird, right? <laughs> you don't realize how often you're, how little you look at her. Uh, wives, you, you, you do the same thing. Recognizing the emotion. I want to make sure we mention this. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about matching the emotion, and when, you're, when your spouse is worked up, if you can kind of get yourself worked up too, not at the person, but with the person, that you're going to get a lot farther in your communication. Uh, but it can go another way as well. If, if husbands, if she's telling you a story and you pick up on the fact that she's mad, whether you think she should be or not, just recognize that, oh, I can see that's really frustrating. It sounds odd to say it, but it makes our wives feel like we hear what they're saying to us. It makes them feel like, like, they're, like we're connecting to them, even though we have no idea what's going on. But they don't know that. That's the best part. Did I just say that in front of them? <laughs> Last, I want you to listen to understand rather than listening to respond. We have a bad habit of only saying words that, uh, that are a response to the things that we hear. Um, I want to give you a couple other things. Talking. You would think, I start with listening, and that's an easy one because we all understand we're kind of bad at that. Uh, a lot of us are really bad at talking too. We just don't recognize it as much. And here's what I mean by talking. Men, and, and I realize I'm gender stereotyping, and I do apologize for that because some of you men, some of you are probably like me. April can attest to this. I don't ever stop talking. Uh, so some of you may have that problem as well. But talking by and large, uh, if we're going to gender stereotype men, you're going to have to give more than just the basic pertinent information. You're going to have to talk beyond the answer to the question. Okay, I'm about to do an activity with you, and your, your partner's going to ask you a question. There are going to be questions you could answer in three sentences, but don't. Keep talking. When you think you've said enough, say some more. And if you think you've said enough, then say a little bit more, and then maybe try uh, another question. But talking is an important part of this conversation. Um, in a healthy marriage, talking is not about conveying information, but that's, it's utilitarian for us as men. That's what we do. We speak in grunts and nods. Mm. It's utilitarian. Uh, fix this. I move this. We, that's how we speak. Men, in a healthy marriage, it's not about conveying information. It is the vehicle that drives your intimacy. And I mean this. If you're a talker, if you're a talker, especially men, if you're a talker, the odds are much higher that you're going to have a happy marriage because you're probably going to talk to your wife because she's a captive audience. She can't go anywhere. And you guys are going to talk to each other, and you're going to grow, and you're going to learn, and you're going to laugh, and you're going to joke. Uh, talking is a major part of this, and again, it's not that complicated. Now, I don't mean to, to, to broad stroke categorize, but by and large, men, I've been picking on you. We struggle with depth. We struggle, struggle to say a lot. Women, your tone. I got some guys in here who want to nod, but they're afraid to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Tone. For the record, this is a wife-approved slide. It is a struggle. You don't realize sometimes how you come across, or you do realize it, but you don't care. <laughs> It'll just keep coming. All right, that's fine if that's the way things are going to be, but I'm going to talk at the end tonight, and I want you to hear this. I'm going to talk at the end tonight about how the idea that we're just supposed to accept what we are at face value and the other person's supposed to live with that, eh, that's a trade-off. So if that's, if that's your argument, well, I just, that, I don't, I have a tone problem. All right. All right, round two. Take a look at the second activity. The second activity is the interview game. Here is how I want you to complete this task. This task is going to involve you and your spouse having a, a conversation with each other. I do not anticipate you will get more than maybe a question or two into this. If you get to question five or six, you're going too fast and not giving enough information. If you stay on question one, that's fine. Here's what I want you to do. 
Between the two of you, I want you to pick a question. It can be because it's a question that you like, or it can be what April and I normally do, and it can be a random number. Pick a number and just answer that question. I want you to answer it each, uh, and I want you to focus on what we've talked about. I want you to focus on talking, and I want you to focus on listening. When it's your turn to talk, I want you to talk in the way we described. When it's your turn to listen, I want you to listen in the way you described, in the way I described. One quick note, and I, and I meant to mention this before the first activity, and I didn't. I have a lot of you here who are flying solo tonight because work schedules prevented your spouse from being here. If you are one of those people, in this time, during this activity, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go through these questions. I want you to put some, uh, some notes. Circle the, the questions that you think you could answer pretty easily about your spouse. And the ones that you can't, I want you to put a mark next to those as well. I want you to, your partner may not be here, but they can be on your mind. I want you to spend the next five minutes going through these questions and imagining what your partner might say and then go home and see if I'm right or see if you're right. All right, I'm going to give you five minutes on this activity and then we're going to wrap this up. All right, we have got just about five minutes to wrap this thing up. And the reason, the reason we've only got about five minutes to wrap this up is because uh, we want to make sure we're, we're being respectful of all the, the teachers in the, in the kids' wing uh, and not uh, asking them to stay late. We take our communication for granted. Um, we tend to think one of two things about our communication. Either number one, we all think we're really good at it, or we know we're not, and we use that as an excuse to not get better. And here's what I mean. I mean, I, I hear a lot from husbands and wives. I hear a lot, I'm just not really a talker. And we put that out there as though the other person is supposed to just accept that. Men, if your response and the reason that you don't communicate with your wife is because you're, quote, not a talker, then don't be upset when she tells you she's just not that into having sex. Do you see what I mean? I did, and women, I may have just given you a powerful tool. <laughs> the reality is we don't just accept those things about our partner at face value. We love them and we love who they are, but we accept that they're going to commit to trying to make changes that are meaningful to us as a spouse. And if you're not a talker, men, and again, I know I'm picking on men a lot tonight. If you're not a talker, be more of a talker. As simple as I can say it. This takes practice, but it can be done. It can be learned. Women, if you're not much of a talker, be more of a talker. It takes practice, but it can absolutely be done. The stuff we talked about tonight, say more than you're, than you're comfortable saying and listen intently. And you will find when someone is zeroed in, locked in on you, listening to you, you have a tendency to say more anyway, and it's safer. And here's the crazy part. If you did what we talked about doing just a second ago, you grew in your relationship with your spouse in a, in a span of five minutes. It wasn't a lot, and, there, and you need to do it a lot more, but you grew a little bit in that period of time. Uh, here's the takeaway from tonight. Number one, Paul told us to submit. To create that kind of environment, you need to do a couple of things. One, you need to know each other really, really well. The better you know each other, the easier submission is going to be, and the more natural it's going to become in your marriage. Next, I want you to remember that the happiest marriages look an awful lot like the closest friendships. And finally, love maps, that's what you did tonight, can be the key to avoiding trouble and navigating it when you do encounter it. Uh, and again, how do love maps? And when I say love maps, I just mean the intimate knowledge you have about each other. How does that get you out of trouble? Because all the research that's ever been done in couples who display some of those negative marital outcomes, they all indicate the same thing. The people who don't struggle with the negative stuff are not the ones who don't have any problems. They're the ones that have really detailed love maps. If you can answer every single one of those questions that, that we did in round one, the odds are you and your spouse have a pretty calm, pretty mild, pretty loving relationship. And the same is definitely true for round two. Um, if you struggle to answer those questions, I would argue the opposite is probably true as well. Uh, take a look at page four. Page four says for future use. Um, I put some instructions at the top of page four. Those instructions, I want to I want to point them out. I have no expectation, men. I mean this for you. I have no expectation that you're going to go home and do and do uh, the for, for future use section. In fact, I'm going to insist that you don't. Those topics are really deep. They are really involved questions, and in fact, you can only get through one of those questions every couple of days if you're going to do it right. I want you, when we're done, and when I say when we're done, I mean when October rolls around and we're done, I want you to have this piece of paper somewhere handy, and I want you to go back through that. I want you to go back through the for future use section. Uh, but tonight, I just want you to understand something. The questions you have in that packet, that is the roadmap for rediscovering your partner. It's the platform on which we're going to build a bunch of the stuff that we're going to do over the course of the next seven weeks. It's also the first step towards renewing your marriage and reimagining your marriage. That's a part of the title for a reason. It's not just because I think it sounds neat. 
reimagining your marriage because I want you to reimagine that your marriage can be way less complicated than you think it has to be. Reimagine that it doesn't take crisis or rain and crying and embracing in the rain and talking about how many letters you wrote each other every day. That's not a requirement for true love and passionate marriage. I want you to reimagine that the path through your most difficult times is not to learn proper fighting technique. Although there's some merit to that and we will do some of that. But that's not the path to a happy marriage. That's not a path out of trouble. The path out of trouble is when you're not in trouble to spend a lot of time having the conversations you had tonight. Which leads me to my last point tonight. You've got homework. Um, I told you you were going to have some fun. I told you you were going to enjoy each other. And here's what I want. I want that to be at the forefront of your mind. The two pages of activities. The, the love map game and the, uh, the interview questions. Over the course of the next seven days, between now and the next time I see you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go through as many of the first page questions as you can. Those are pretty simple. They are uh, trivia questions about each other. Um, they should be pretty fun. And if you don't know an answer to a question, talk about it so that now you do know the answer to a question. And then, once you've done that, if you have time in the next seven days to move on to the second section, then move on to the second section. I'll tell you um, how April and I tend to use these questions. And for the record, we do use these questions. Uh, we'll use them at random times after the kids are in bed. We'll go through some of these cards because they're, they're fun. We enjoy them. When we're in the car, we'll go through some of these questions because they're fun and we enjoy them. It's a hobby. As weird as that sounds, it's not about doing this when we feel disconnect from each other. It's about doing this all the time because we like talking to each other. I want you to like talking to the person next to you. And if you go through these questions with the right attitude, I think you'll find that you can get there. Um, there's a summary page on the back of this. And, and the summary page, ordinarily, I, I try to go through the summary page together when we're doing this. We're not going to do that tonight in the interest of time uh, because I want to make sure we're out of here uh, in time to pick up your kiddos. Um, that summary page is a great conversation to have on the way home. It's real simple. It's what, what was I good at? What was I not so good at? And what do I want to get better at? It's that basic conversation. So I want you to do something. Either go through the summary page together or at the very least, go through a couple more questions on the way home. Go back to, uh, to where we started in activity one and keep quizzing each other and keep your running score. It is fun to compete in that game if you can do it without throwing stuff. All right, next week, I want to tell you what we're going to do next week before I let you go. Next week, the theme is going to be enhancing the good vibes. You know what's going to happen next week? I'm going to give you a whole bunch of really positive words and a whole bunch of really positive things, and you're going to get to talk about your partner to your partner. You're going to tell them all the great things you think about them. You're going to tell them all the wonderful things you've ever thought about them. Okay? Next week is literally an opportunity to put you and your spouse next to each other and just talk really, really nice to each other. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a roadmap for doing that, I'm going to give you all the tools you're going to need to pull that off. I hope, I genuinely hope I'll see you again next week. Uh, this is a phenomenal group, uh, and I hope we can continue this throughout the months of, of August and September. Uh, we're going to close out in prayer, and then if you've got kids in the back, if you guys will uh, go take care of that.